Chapter 8 Organized Planning The Crystallization of Desire into Action The Sixth Step Toward Riches You have learned that everything we create or acquire begins in the form of desire. Desire is taken on the first lap of its journey from the abstract to the concrete in the workshop of the imagination where plans for its transition are created and organized. In Chapter 3, Desire, you were instructed to take six practical steps to begin translating your desire for money into its monetary equivalent. One of the steps you must take is the formation of a definite practical plan or plans through which this transformation may be made. Following are the basic instructions for making practical plans. Ally yourself with a group of as many people as you may need for the creation and carrying out of your plan or plans for the accumulation of money, making use of the mastermind principle. Compliance with this instruction is absolutely essential. Do not neglect it. Editor's comment. The mastermind alliance is built of two or more minds working actively together in perfect harmony toward a common goal. This concept was introduced in Chapter 6, Specialized Knowledge, and is described in more detail in Chapter 11, The Power of the Mastermind. This is the end of the editor's comment. Before forming your Mastermind Alliance, decide what advantages and benefits you may offer the individual members of your group in return for their cooperation. No one will work indefinitely without some form of compensation. No intelligent person should request or expect another to work without adequate compensation, although this may not always be in the form of money. Arrange to meet with the members of your mastermind group at least twice a week, and more often if possible, until you have jointly perfected the necessary plan or plans for the accumulation of money. Maintain perfect harmony between yourself and every member of your mastermind group. If you fail to carry out this instruction to the letter, you may expect to meet with failure. The mastermind principle cannot work where perfect harmony does not prevail. Keep in mind these facts. You are engaged in an undertaking of major importance to you. To be sure of success, you must have plans that are faultless. You must have the advantage of the experience, education, native ability, and imagination of other minds. This is the way it has been done by every person who has accumulated a great fortune. No individual has sufficient experience, education, natural ability, and knowledge to ensure the accumulation of a great fortune without the cooperation of other people. Every plan you adopt for making money should be the joint creation of yourself and every other member of your mastermind group. You may originate your own plans, either in whole or in part, but see that those plans are checked and approved by the members of your Mastermind Alliance. If your first plan fails, try another. If the first plan that you adopt does not work successfully, replace it with a new plan. If this new plan fails to work, replace it with still another, and so on, until you find a plan that does work. Right here is the point at which the majority of people meet with failure because of their lack of persistence in creating new plans to take the place of those that fail. The most intelligent person living cannot succeed in accumulating money or in any other undertaking without plans that are practical and workable. Just keep this fact in mind and remember when your plans fail that temporary defeat is not permanent failure. It may only mean that your plans have not been sound. Build other plans. Start all over again. Temporary defeat should mean only one thing, the certain knowledge that there is something wrong with your plan. Millions of people go through life in misery and poverty because they lack a sound plan through which to accumulate a fortune. Your achievement can only be as good as the plans you make. You are never whipped until you quit in your own mind. James J. Hill, who was the greatest railroad builder of them all, met with temporary defeat when he first tried to raise the capital needed to build the Great Northern Railroad from the east to the west. But he turned defeat into victory through new plans. Henry Ford met with temporary defeat not only at the beginning of his automobile career, 
but even after he had gone a long way toward the top. But he, too, created new plans and went marching on to financial victory. We see people who have accumulated great fortunes, but we often recognize only their triumph, and we overlook the temporary defeats that they had to surmount before arriving. No follower of this philosophy can reasonably expect to accumulate a fortune without experiencing temporary defeat. When defeat comes, accept it as a signal that your plans are not sound. Rebuild those plans and set sail once more toward your goal. If you give up before your goal has been reached, you're a quitter. A quitter never wins and a winner never quits. Write this sentence on a piece of paper in letters an inch high and place it where you will see it every night before you go to sleep and every morning before you go to work. When you begin to select members for your mastermind group, choose those who do not take defeat seriously. Some people foolishly believe that only money can make money. This is not true. Desire, transmuted into its monetary equivalent through the principles in this book, is the way money is made. Money, of itself, is nothing but inert matter. It cannot move, think, or talk, but it can hear when someone who desires it calls it to come. Intelligent planning is essential for success in any undertaking designed to accumulate riches. Following are detailed instructions to those who must begin the accumulation of riches by selling personal services. It should encourage you to know that practically all the great fortunes began either from selling personal services or from the sale of ideas. When you think about it, what else except ideas and personal services can you give in return for riches if you don't have products or property? Leaders and Followers Broadly speaking, there are two types of people in the world. One type is known as leaders and the other as followers. Decide at the outset whether you intend to become a leader in your chosen calling or remain a follower. The difference in compensation is vast. The follower cannot expect to make as much as a leader, although some followers make the mistake of thinking they should. It is no disgrace to be a follower. On the other hand, it is no credit to remain a follower. Most great leaders began as followers. They became great leaders because they were intelligent followers. With few exceptions, the person who cannot follow a leader intelligently cannot become an efficient leader. The person who can follow a leader most efficiently is usually the person who develops into leadership most rapidly. An intelligent follower has many advantages, including the opportunity to acquire knowledge from the leader. The Major Attributes of Leadership The following are important factors of leadership. 1. Unwavering courage based upon knowledge of yourself and your occupation. No follower wishes to be dominated by a leader who lacks self-confidence and courage. Certainly no intelligent follower will be dominated by such a leader for very long. 2. Self-control. The person who cannot control himself can never control others. Self-control sets a strong example for your followers which the more intelligent followers will emulate. 3. A keen sense of justice. Without a sense of fairness and justice, no leader can command and retain the respect of their followers. 4. Definiteness of decision. Those who waver in decisions show that they are not sure of themselves and therefore cannot lead others successfully. 5. Definiteness of plans. Successful leaders must plan their work and work their plans. Leaders who move by guesswork without practical definite plans are like a ship without a rudder. Sooner or later, they will land on the rocks. 6. The habit of doing more than paid for. One of the penalties of leadership is the necessity of the leaders to willingly do more than they require of their followers. 7. A pleasing personality. Leadership calls for respect. Followers will not respect a leader who does not grade high on all of the factors of a pleasing personality. 8. Sympathy and understanding. 
Successful leaders must be in sympathy with their followers. Moreover, they must understand them and their problems. 9. Mastery of Detail Successful leadership calls for mastery of the details of the leader's position. 10. Willingness to assume full responsibility. Successful leaders must be willing to assume responsibility for the mistakes and the shortcomings of their followers. If a leader tries to shift this responsibility, that leader will not remain the leader. If one of your followers makes a mistake or is incompetent, you must consider that it is you who failed. 11. Cooperation. The successful leader must understand and apply the principle of cooperative effort and be able to induce followers to do the same. Leadership calls for power, and power calls for cooperation. There are two forms of leadership. The first, and by far the most effective, is leadership by consent of and with the sympathy of the followers. The second is leadership by force, without the consent and sympathy of the followers. History is filled with evidences that leadership by force cannot endure. The downfall and disappearance of dictators and kings is significant. It means that people will not follow forced leadership indefinitely. Napoleon, Mussolini, Hitler were examples of leadership by force. Their leadership passed. Editor's comment. The following may also be added to the list. Idi Amin, Francisco Franco, Saddam Hussein, Ferdinand Marcos, Svobodan Milosevic, Juan Perón, General Augusto Pinochet, Pol Pot, General Suharto, the Taliban leaders in Afghanistan, Marshal Josip Broz Tito, Joseph Stalin, and subsequent leaders of the Soviet Union, East Germany, and the other countries in the Communist bloc. This is the end of the editor's comment. Those that remain see their power eroding and slipping away. Leadership by consent of the followers is the only leadership that can endure. People may follow forced leadership temporarily, but they will not do so willingly. Successful leaders will embrace the 11 factors of leadership described in this chapter, as well as some other factors. Those who make these attributes the basis of their leadership will find abundant opportunity to lead in any walk of life. The 10 Major Causes of Failure in Leadership The following are the major faults of leaders who fail. It is just as essential for you to know what not to do as it is to know what to do. 1. Inability to organize details Efficient leadership calls for the ability to organize and master details. No genuine leader is ever too busy to do anything that may be required in the capacity as leader whether a leader or follower, when you admit that you are too busy to change your plans or to give attention to any emergency, you are admitting your inefficiency. The successful leader must be the master of all details connected with the position. That means, of course, that you must acquire the habit of relegating details to capable lieutenants. 2. Unwillingness to render humble service. Truly great leaders are willing, when occasion demands, to perform any sort of labor that they would ask another to perform. The greatest among ye shall be the servant of all is a truth that all able leaders observe and respect. 3. Expectation of pay for what they know instead of what they do with what they know. The world does not pay you for what you know. It pays you for what you do or what you induce others to do. 4. Fear of competition from followers. Leaders who fear that one of their followers may take their position are practically sure to realize that fear sooner or later. Able leaders train understudies to whom they may delegate any of the details of their position. Only in this way can leaders multiply themselves and be at many places and give attention to many things at one time. It is an eternal truth that leaders receive more pay for their ability to get others to perform than they could possibly earn by their own efforts. An efficient leader may, through knowledge of the job and a magnetic personality, greatly increase the efficiency of others and get them to render more service and better service than they could render without the leader's guidance. 5. Lack of imagination. 
Without imagination, the leader is incapable of meeting emergencies or of creating plans by which to guide followers efficiently. 6. Selfishness Leaders who claim all the honor for the work of their followers are sure to be met by resentment. The really great leader claims none of the honors. Great leaders are content to see the honors when there are any go to their followers because the great leaders know that most people will work harder for commendation and recognition than they will for money alone. 7. Intemperance Followers do not respect an intemperate leader. Moreover, intemperance in any form destroys the endurance and the vitality of those who indulge in it. 8. Disloyalty Perhaps this should have come at the head of the list. Leaders who are not loyal to their duty and to those both above and below them cannot maintain their leadership for long. Disloyalty marks you as being less than the dust of the earth and it will bring the contempt it deserves. Lack of loyalty is one of the major causes of failure in every walk of life. 9. Emphasis of the authority of leadership. The efficient leader leads by encouraging and not by trying to instill fear in the hearts of those who follow. Leaders who try to impress their followers with their authority come within the category of leadership through force. If you are a real leader, you will have no need to advertise that fact. It is apparent in your conduct, by your sympathy, understanding, fairness, and a demonstration that you know your job. 10. Emphasis of Title Competent leaders require no title to give them the respect of their followers. Leaders who make too much of their titles generally have little else to emphasize. The doors to the office of the real leader are open to all and free from formality or ostentation. These are among the most common causes of failure in leadership. Any one of these faults is sufficient to cause failure. Study the list carefully if you aspire to leadership and make sure that you are free of these faults. Editor's Comment Warren Bennis, a professor who teaches management and organization, said, A manager is someone who does things right. A leader is someone who does the right thing. Admiral Grace Hopper was the ranking female Navy officer when she was interviewed for 60 Minutes. She said, You manage things. You lead people. This is the end of the editor's comment. When and how to apply for a position. The information described here is the net result of many years of experience during which thousands of men and women were helped to market their services effectively. Editor's Comment The internet, email and faxed resumes have radically changed the way employers search for new employees and the way that most people apply for jobs. However, Think and Grow Rich was never intended for most people. It was written for those who want to stand out. If you are such a person, the editors of this revised and updated edition strongly advise that you give serious thought to each of the following suggestions about how to apply for a position and how to prepare a resume. If you are tempted to think the suggestions are too obvious, simplistic, or out of date, we assure you they are not. In those instances where it is appropriate to update the material, we have added commentary. This is the end of the editor's comment. 1. Employment agencies. Care must be taken to select only reputable companies that can show adequate records of achievement of satisfactory results. Editor's comment. As anyone in the job market knows, today employment agencies range from companies that supply temporary office help to headhunters who connect high-level executives with companies seeking experienced management talent. If you are seeking a mid to upper level position, the old adage that you get what you pay for is particularly true. This is the end of the editor's comment. 2. Advertising in newspapers, trade journals, magazines. 
Classified advertising may produce satisfactory results for those applying for entry-level, clerical, or salaried positions. For those seeking executive positions, a well-written and well-designed display ad, though more expensive, may be more desirable. The copy should be prepared by an expert who understands how to inject sufficient selling qualities to produce replies. Editor's Comment For individuals, the display ad approach is not very common in the contemporary job market. But for that reason, if you are sure of the position you want, a well-written and well-designed ad selling yourself and placed in the right trade paper or industry journal might be just the thing to get the attention you want. However, if you attempt this approach, be prepared that it will be an expensive experiment. In effect, you will have gone into the advertising business. And it is a rule of thumb in advertising that a single ad rarely sells anything. It usually requires multiple exposures before the buyer, the potential employer, is motivated to buy, hire, a product, you. This is the end of the editor's comment. 3. Personal Letters of Application These should be directed to particular firms or individuals that could need the kind of service or experience you have to offer. Letters should be neatly typed always and signed by hand. You should include a complete resume or outline of your qualifications. Both the letter of application and the resume should be prepared by an expert. Editor's Comment in the contemporary job market, sending a letter of application when no job has been advertised can, in fact, be a very successful approach. But this is only for those who truly know what they want and will take the time to prepare a convincing presentation. Managers in a position to hire always have an eye out for good prospective employees. If they receive a well-constructed and intriguing presentation that clearly states you are interested in a position whenever one is available, it will not be thrown away. And the first thing good managers do when a position comes open is go to their files. When that happens, if your presentation made a good and convincing impression, it will be there. The only question is, are you willing to make yourself available when they are ready for you? If you are just blanketing everyone with a stock letter in hopes of getting a job, it very likely won't work. This approach is not for someone looking for a job. This approach is only for those who really want a specific career. This is the end of the editor's comment. 4. Application in person. In some instances, it may be more effective if the applicant personally offers his or her services to prospective employers, in which event a complete written statement of qualifications for the position should be presented, as prospective employers will often wish to discuss your record with associates. Editor's Comment Asking for an interview when no job has been advertised is an even stronger statement that you know what you want and you are serious about working in a particular industry. If you pursue this approach, keep in mind that you are asking someone to give you their time. Some managers will not be receptive because it does not fit into their company's business practice and some managers will just find it an annoyance. This approach will work for you only if you are confident that you can make an outstanding impression in person. If you make a strong, positive impression, it will be remembered when an opening is available. This is the end of the editor's comment. 5. Application through personal acquaintances. When possible, the applicant should approach prospective employers through some mutual acquaintance. This method is particularly advantageous in the case of those who seek executive connections and do not wish to appear to be peddling themselves. Information to be supplied in a written resume. A good resume should be prepared as carefully as a lawyer would prepare the brief for a case to be tried in court. Unless the applicant is experienced in the preparation of such briefs, an expert should be consulted for this purpose. When successful businesses want to advertise, they hire specialists who understand the psychology of advertising to sell their products. If you are selling your personal services, you should do the same. Editor's Comment The job market in America has never been as bad as it was when Napoleon Hill wrote the preceding paragraph. Because of the Great Depression, many adults had never had any kind of steady job, 
let alone sought a career position, and there were few places to learn how to do it. Since that time, many excellent books have been published on the subject, and companies that offer professional help in preparing resumes have become very common. However, neither books nor copywriters are magic. It all begins with what you have to offer. The editors of this edition suggest that you start to assemble your presentation using the guidelines that appear below. Once you have a first draft, you should review at least one of the books on the subject to see what suggestions are offered that might help you sell yourself better than you have already done. Then, depending how satisfied you are, you might also want to seek advice from a professional who specializes in such presentations. We offer two notes of caution. First, make sure that your presentation does not look like something turned out by a resume mill. Having received many resumes over the years, the editors warn you that some professionals use the same stock phrases, buzzwords, and formats for every client, and this can be a dead giveaway that someone else prepared your resume, or that you have simply copied from a book. Your intention should be to make yours stand out. The second word of caution is, don't go overboard in trying to stand out. There is a balance between catching an employer's attention and looking like you are trying too hard. For instance, if you are a New York marketing executive applying to a Los Angeles company, sending your application with a bag of fresh bagels by next morning FedEx would probably make a good impression, whereas sending a dartboard with your picture in the center might be viewed as just a little too cute and a little too much. Clever is good, but professional is a must. Never be so clever that you don't look professional. Following are a set of guidelines for preparing your resume. Because part of your search for a position will involve responding to ads for job openings, and because it has become common to respond by faxing applications and resumes, Napoleon Hill's guidelines should be used to prepare two separate presentations. As Hill suggests below, you should prepare an elaborate presentation to be used when mailed or presented in person. But you should also prepare a second, shorter version that is designed specifically to be faxed. Take care to make your fax version complete and interesting, but it should be no more than three pages. The following information should appear in your presentation. 1. Education. State briefly, but definitely, what schooling you've had and in what subjects you specialized in school, giving the reasons for that specialization. Editor's Comments. Never exaggerate. This is very serious advice, and it applies not only to education, but also the next two categories, experience and references. Smart employers will check in all three areas. Labor laws have become so demanding that employers filling responsible positions are very cautious about whom they hire in the first place. There are rules about such things as the difference between salaried and hourly employment, sexual harassment, what constitutes grounds for dismissal, what questions can and cannot be asked in job interviews, and a host of other things that leave the employer open to potential lawsuits. Consequently, smart employers, the kind you want to work for, will check your education, experience, and references. Also, bear in mind, you are providing information that will follow you for the rest of your career. If you keep up with the news, you know that in recent times, even executives headed for the top have been dismissed. Military men have resigned in disgrace. Politicians have been removed from office, and professors have been forced to resign, all because someone looked into their background and found that they had exaggerated their qualifications. This is the end of the editor's comments. 2. Experience If you have had experience in connection with positions similar to the one you seek, describe it fully. Give the names and addresses of former employers. Be sure to clearly point out any special experience you may have had that would equip you to fill the position you seek. 3. References Practically every business firm wants to know as much as possible about the background of prospective employees who seek positions of responsibility. Attach copies of letters from former employers, from teachers under whom you studied, and from prominent people whose judgment may be relied upon. 4 photograph of yourself. Include a recent professional photograph of yourself 
as a part of your presentation. Editor's Comment In the contemporary job market, this is not a common practice at all. However, from personal experience, the editors of this edition know it can be advantageous. We have received only one such job application, but unquestionably it was the photograph that prompted us to ask the applicant to come in for an interview. If you are confident that your appearance makes a good, professional impression, you may want to consider this unusual approach. There is the danger that you may be seen as vain or self-centered, but it could also be the thing that gives you an edge. This is the end of the editor's comment. 5. Apply for a specific position. Never apply for just a job. That indicates you lack specialized qualifications. 6. State your qualifications for the particular position for which you apply. Give full details why you believe you are qualified for the particular position you seek. This is the most important detail of your application. It will determine, more than anything else, what consideration you receive. 7. Offer to go to work on probation. This may appear to be a radical suggestion, but experience has proved that it seldom fails to win at least a trial. If you are sure of your qualifications, a trial is all you need. Incidentally, such an offer indicates that you have confidence in your ability to fill the position you seek. It is most convincing. Make it clear that your offer is based on your confidence in your ability to fill the position. Your confidence in your prospective employer's decision to employ you after the trial period and your determination to have the position. Editor's Comments As you will learn in Chapter 10, when you read the story of Napoleon Hill's application to Rufus Ayers, Hill gives this advice based on his personal experience. Unfortunately, this is one of those instances where times may have changed so much that the approach is rarely applicable. In today's environment, Modern labor laws and business practice may prevent an employer from taking you up on your offer. However, today many companies do have internship programs that allow an employer to test drive employees to see how well they might fit in. This is the end of the editor's comment. 8. Knowledge of your prospective employer's business. Before applying for a position, do sufficient research to familiarize yourself thoroughly with that business and indicate the knowledge you have acquired in this field. This will be impressive because it indicates that you have imagination and a real interest in the position you seek. Editor's Comment When you do this, and you certainly should, bear in mind that you will be talking with people who really know the business. Even by researching extensively, at best you will only know about their business. If you try to appear too knowledgeable or familiar, it may backfire and reveal that you have only a superficial view of the business. Unless you are already working in a particular industry and have insights based on experience, do not be presumptuous. Use your knowledge to indicate that you have taken the time to educate yourself and that you really are interested, but don't try to tell a prospective employer how you would run the business. This is the end of the editor's comment. Remember that it is not the lawyer who knows the most law but the one who best prepares his case, who wins. If your case is properly prepared and presented, your victory will have been more than half won at the outset. Do not be afraid of making your presentation too long. Employers are just as much interested in purchasing the services of well-qualified applicants as you are in securing employment. In fact, the success of most successful employers is due to their ability to select well-qualified lieutenants. They want all the information available. Editor's Comment As noted above, when faxing a resume, it should be no more than three pages and should state that you will be pleased to provide a more detailed resume if required. This is the end of the Editor's Comment. Remember another thing. Neatness in the preparation of your resume and application will indicate that you are a painstaking person. Successful salespeople groom themselves with care. They understand that first impressions are lasting. Your presentation is your sales rep. Give it a good suit of clothes so it will stand out in bold contrast to anything else your prospective employer ever saw. If the position you seek is worth having, 
it is worth going after with care. More important, if you sell yourself in a manner that shows off your individuality, you probably will receive more money from the very start than you would if you applied for employment in the usual conventional way. When your resume package has been completed, you should prepare individual and personalized copies for each company or person to whom it will be presented. This personal touch is sure to command attention. Have it neatly typed, proofread, printed, and properly bound on the finest paper you can obtain. Your photograph should be mounted and included on one of the pages. Prepare a separate binding with the proper company name inserted if it is to be shown to more than one company. If you seek employment through an employment agency, have the agent use copies of your presentation in marketing your services. This will help to gain preference for you, both with the agent and the prospective employers. I've helped to prepare presentations for clients that were so striking and out of the ordinary that they resulted in the employment of the applicant without a personal interview. If you want similar results, follow the instructions to the letter, improving upon them however your imagination suggests. Editor's Comments Today, every office supply store offers a wide variety of paper stock, folders, binders, and presentation materials that can be put together in a way that is both unique and professional looking. With all of those possibilities available, if you simply present standard sheets of paper stapled in the corner, the response will very likely be standard too. If you apply a little creativity, you should have no trouble preparing a presentation that is tailored to the company to which you are applying, appropriate for the position you seek, and reflective of your personality and style. This is the end of the editor's comments. How to get the exact position you desire. Everyone enjoys doing the kind of work for which he or she is best suited. An artist loves to work with paints, a craftsman with his or her hands, a writer loves to write. Those with less definite talents have their preferences for certain fields of business and industry. If America does anything well, it offers a full range of occupations. 1. Decide exactly what kind of a job you want. If the job doesn't already exist, perhaps you can create it. 2. Choose the company or individual for whom you wish to work. 3. Study your prospective employer as to policies, personnel, and chances for advancement. 4. By analysis of yourself, your talents, and your capabilities, figure what you can offer. Plan specific ways and means of giving advantages, services, developments, or ideas that you believe you can successfully deliver. 5. Forget about a job. Forget whether or not there is an opening. Forget the usual routine of, have you got a job for me? Concentrate on what you can give. 6. Once you have your plan in mind, put it on paper in neat form and in full detail. 7. Present it to the proper person with authority and the rest will come automatically. Every company is looking for people who can give something of value, whether it is ideas, services, or connections. Every company has room for the person who has a definite plan of action that is to the advantage of that company. This procedure may take a few days or weeks of extra time, but the difference in income, in advancement, and in gaining recognition will save years of hard work at small pay. It has many advantages, the main one being that it will often save you from one to five years of your time in reaching a chosen goal. Every person who starts or gets in halfway up the ladder does so by deliberate and careful planning. The New Way of Marketing Services Men and women who market their services must recognize the change that has taken place in connection with the relationship between employer and employee. The future relationship should be more in the nature of a partnership consisting of the employer, the employee, and the public they serve. In the past, employers and employees have bartered among themselves not considering that in reality they were bargaining at the expense of the third party, the public they serve. 
both the employer and the employee should consider themselves as fellow employees whose business it will be to serve the public efficiently. Editor's Comment In the preceding paragraph, Napoleon Hill once again demonstrates his foresight into the future direction of American business. As you will recognize in the following section, the point he makes by citing the coal and gas companies would at a later time be equally applicable to the telephone monopolies, and later still to computer software and internet companies, and to cable television suppliers when competitors started to offer satellite TV. This snapshot of how and why business has changed should provide you with a blueprint for the attitude you must adopt and the way you must conduct yourself if you are going to attain the success you're seeking. This is the end of the editor's comment. During the Depression, I spent several months in the anthracite coal region of Pennsylvania, studying conditions that all but destroyed the coal industry. The coal operators and the unions drove hard bargains in negotiating their labor contracts. The cost of the bargaining was passed on to the customer by adding to the price of the coal. However, in the end, they discovered their actions had worked against them. What their delays and high prices had actually accomplished was to open the market to their competitors. Inadvertently, they had built up a wonderful business for the manufacturers of oil-burning stoves and furnaces, as well as for the producers of oil. A similar experience happened to the gas companies. We can all remember the time when the gas meter reader pounded on the door hard enough to break the panels. When the door was opened, he pushed his way in uninvited with a scowl on his face that plainly said, What the hell did you keep me waiting for? All that has undergone a change. The meter man now conducts himself as a gentleman who is delighted to be at your service, sir. Before the gas companies learned that their scowling meter men were offending customers, their competitors, the polite salesmen of oil burners, came along and did a land office business. These illustrations are mentioned here to show that we are where we are and what we are because of our own conduct. If there is a principle of cause and effect that controls business, finance, and transportation, this same principle controls individuals and determines their economic status. Courtesy and service are the watchwords of merchandising today, and they apply to the person who is marketing personal services even more directly than to the employer. In the final analysis, you are employed by the customer. If you fail to serve well, both you and your employer will pay for it by the loss of the privilege of serving. What is your QQS rating? In the preceding, the causes of success in marketing services effectively and permanently have been clearly described. Unless those causes are studied, analyzed, understood, and applied, no one can market services effectively and permanently. Every man or woman must be their own sales force of their personal services. The quality and the quantity of service rendered, and the spirit in which it is rendered, determine the price and the duration of employment. To market your personal services effectively, which means a permanent market at a satisfactory price under pleasant conditions, you must adopt and follow the QQS formula. QQS means that quality plus quantity plus the proper spirit of cooperation equals perfect salesmanship of service. Remember the QQS formula, but do more. Apply it as a habit. Analyze the formula to make sure you understand exactly what it means. Quality of service means the performance of every detail in connection with your position in the most efficient manner possible with the object of greater efficiency always in mind. Quantity of service means the habit of rendering all the service of which you are capable at all times with the purpose of increasing the amount of service rendered as you develop greater skill through practice and experience. Emphasis is again placed on the word habit. Spirit of service means the habit of agreeable, harmonious conduct, which will induce cooperation from associates and fellow employees. Adequate quality and adequate quantity of service 
is not sufficient to maintain a permanent market for your services. The spirit in which you deliver service is a strong determining factor in connection with both the price you receive and the duration of your employment. Andrew Carnegie stressed this point in his description of the factors that lead to success in the marketing of personal services. He emphasized again and again the necessity for harmonious conduct. He stressed the fact that he would not retain any man, no matter how great a quantity or how efficient the quality of his work, unless he worked in a spirit of harmony. Mr. Carnegie insisted upon his people working with each other in an agreeable manner. To prove that he placed a high value on this quality, he helped many who met his standards to become very wealthy. Those who did not conform had to make room for others who did. The importance of a pleasing personality has been stressed because it is so important in rendering service in the proper spirit. If you have a personality that pleases and you render service in a spirit of harmony, these assets often make up for what you may lack in both the quality and the quantity of service you render. Nothing, however, can be successfully substituted for pleasing conduct. The Capital Value of Your Services The person whose income is derived entirely from the sale of personal services is a merchant, just like the person who sells hard goods and such a person is subject to exactly the same rules of conduct as the merchant who sells merchandise. I emphasize this because many people who live by the sale of personal services make the mistake of considering themselves free from the rules of conduct and the responsibilities attached to those who are engaged in marketing commodities. The day of the go-getter has been supplanted by the go-giver. The actual capitalized value of your brain power may be determined by the amount of income you can produce by marketing your services. A fair estimate of the capital value of your brain power may be made by using the following assumptions. Money, the amount of capital, can be borrowed from a bank at a certain rate of interest. Money is worth no more than brains, and it is often worth much less. Therefore, if your brain power is as valuable as money, in effect, you should be lending your brain power, your amount of capital, at least at the same rate that banks charge to lend money. This means that what you earn in a year, your income, is comparable to what a bank earns from a loan in a year, the interest they charge. You can then calculate the capital value of your brain power using this formula. Divide 100 by the current rate of interest the banks charge for lending money. Then multiply the result by the amount of your annual income. As an example, assume that the current interest rate is 5%. Assume your annual income is $50,000. The formula would be as follows. 100 divided by 5 equals 20. And 20 multiplied by 50,000 equals $1 million. Therefore, if you lend out your brain power, your capital, at the same rate as the bank lends money, 5% interest, your brain power is worth a million dollars. Competent brains, if effectively marketed, represent a much more desirable form of capital than the money that is required to conduct a business dealing in commodities. This is true because brains are a form of capital that cannot be permanently depreciated by economic depressions nor can this form of capital be stolen or spent. Moreover, the money that is essential for the conduct of business is as worthless as a sand dune until it has been mixed with efficient brains.